Hi everyone, welcome back to Digital Hammurabi. I'm Megan Lewis, your host, and I recently had a conversation with Dr. Bart Ehrman about a new eight lecture course that he will be releasing through his website. It's titled The Unknown Jesus, revealing the secrets of Mark's misunderstood gospel, and gives Bart the opportunity to do a deep dive into his favorite book of the New Testament, The Gospel of Mark. He'll talk about things like whether Mark portrays Jesus as God, how Mark portrays Jesus as an inherently Jewish Messiah, and whether Mark's portrayal of Jesus is historically accurate. Each lecture is 45 minutes long, and there will be two Q&A sessions that will be filmed live on February 18th and 19th, that's 2023. You can access all eight lectures, as well as the Q&A sessions and bonus materials for $59.95. And if you use our affiliate code, the thing that's running across the bottom of your screen, then you help us out with the costs of running Digital Hammurabi also, and we really do appreciate it. This is a really great opportunity to learn about the Book of Mark from one of the world's most renowned biblicists. Uh, yes, I'm biased because I host his podcast, but you know, he's a great teacher. He's really interesting. And I think this would be a really, really fun thing for people who are interested in the history of the Bible and in textual criticism. So we've got a quick preview of what you can expect, and I hope you find it interesting. Wonderful. Hi, Bart. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Still chugging along. Um, it's always a pleasure to see you, and we are here to talk about your new course, which is a deep dive into the Gospel of Mark. Um, and this will surprise no one, but we're starting with literary genre because it is my personal favorite thing in the whole entire world. Um, so what genre is Mark, and how should this influence the way that we read the book? You know, when um, for, for many, many years, when scholars started studying the Gospels, they thought that the uh, Gospels, the four Gospels of the New Testament were sui generis, that there was there was nothing like it. They, like Mark invented a, a genre <laughs> because, of, you know, because it's it, the way they saw it was that Mark is actually writing a narrative that's advancing a theological point about Jesus that he that he died and rose from the dead and that and so this like there was nothing like that in the greek and roman worlds and and it's true that that you know the idea that it's proclaiming the gospel as opposed to something else is is different but in terms of genre it's actually very similar to other kinds of writings we have from uh the greek and roman worlds um uh ancient forms of biography and so uh greeks called them bioi uh lives um and we have lives of uh religious uh religious people uh, from the ancient world, and uh, these, uh, and they begin. You know, they begin. They begin at some point in the chronological narratives of somebody's life. And if it's a religious person, often it's about the religious teachings they convey, uh, possibly the miracles they do, their their martyrdom at the end, or their death. And they're very similar features uh, in other uh, Greek and Roman texts to Mark. And the, one of the reasons that matters is because. You can study these other biographies, ancient biographies. So they're not like modern biographies. This is why this is why I think scholars avoided calling them biographies because then people think it'll be like reading a biography of Jefferson or something. And it's not like that because they didn't have research libraries, they didn't have data retrieval systems, they didn't have. It wasn't like that. But they but they did have ideas of what they wanted to do in biographies. And in biographies, typically the point was to show the character of the person so that it can be emulated. Uh, and so you point out the good points of this person and show, you know, what kind of controversies they got into, what kind of good things they did so you could emulate them. And the other point about them is they always have a beginning that really matters. The beginning sets the stage for the whole thing. And so if you take Mark that way, you need to uh, think about Mark as a uh, as a biography that is trying to uh, point out who Jesus was and that the beginning really matters. That's segues perfectly into my next question. Um, how does Mark begin and how does he really set the stage for the message that he conveys throughout the whole of the book? It's, um, you know, I, I think Mark is, my view is Mark is a really brilliant gospel and that my other view is that most people don't recognize it. They just don't see it because they read over it. You know, it just sounds like Matthew or Luke or something. And so they just kind of, and it's shorter. So uh, it's kind of like a condensed version. Or, and so they don't really, but man, if you pay attention to what he's saying, it just blasts you out of the water. If you really, really pay attention, that's what I'm going to be doing in my course. It's kind of kind of showing, you know, how, but the beginning is great. The beginning, it's just so simple and yet complicated. The beginning is, it, the first sentence is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Okay, well, big deal. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah, well, when you read through Mark, you realize what the big deal is. Um, he he is calling Jesus the Messiah at the very beginning of an account that is all about him getting crucified. So Mark is saying at the outset that this person you all know was a crucified criminal. He's the Messiah. And any you know any Jew in the ancient world who reads that says, "What? <laughs> you got to be kidding me!" And then he immediately launches into he he then quotes scripture as is written in Isaiah the prophet, and he introduces John the Baptist, and. And so, and then John the Baptist comes along. So anybody who's paying attention realizes that this, this author is going to argue that Jesus is the Messiah predicted by God in the scriptures and that he's the fulfillment of all the Jewish expectations and hopes. And yet he got crucified by the enemy. <laughs> how is that the Messiah? And so that Mark, Mark's going to be trying to explain how he could be the Messiah if he's been crucified. Thank you. So Mark, Mark is, the overarching narrative really is, is Jesus as a inherently Jewish Messiah. How does that compare to the other three Gospels? Is it the same message? Is it distinct and, and, and special to Mark, or is it just common across well, all, all of them? All the, others, all the other Gospels agree that Jesus is the Messiah sent from God in fulfillment of the Scriptures, and that um, even the, and because he was crucified, that's what he was supposed to do as Messiah. So they, they agree with that. Um, what is distinctive to Mark uh, one of the one of the many things distinctive to Mark. I'm a, part of my point in this whole lecture lecture series in this course is to show what what why Mark is Mark and he's not something else. He he is not giving the message that John is giving or that Luke is giving and or Matthew. And and the thing about Mark is that Mark is trying to emphasize that Jesus is this Messiah, and nobody understood it. Um, and so part of the part of the thing with Mark is that you don't get in the other Gospels is that nobody can figure him out. <laughs> the, is um, the the Jewish leaders think he's possessed by the devil? That's why he can do all these miracles. And his his family think he's gone crazy. His mother, <laughs> his mother, <laughs> there's no virgin birth in Mark, uh, and so there's nothing about a virgin birth. His mother thinks he's gone crazy. So do his brothers. They try and take him out of the public view. His his townspeople, Nazareth, think that he's just this carpenter. How's he, how's he got all this wisdom? He's just the carpenter next door. And and even the disciples never get it. They do not understand who he is. They, at one point, they start realizing he's the Messiah, but they don't know what that means. And so Mark's whole point is that Jesus is the Messiah that nobody understood. And uh, you don't get that in the other Gospels. So in, in Mark, you get a couple of people kind of getting close to, oh, this, this guy's special. Generally speaking, they're not Jewish, they're Gentiles. Why is Mark so invested in the other characters, people in the gospel, not recognizing Jesus for who he is? Yeah, well, um, this is a big, it's a big debate among scholars why uh, almost nobody recognizes Jesus in the gospel. Um, it the, the the debate began in 1901, so over 120 years ago, uh, with a with a German scholar named um, Wilhelm Vreda, or w William Vreda, uh, who wrote a book called Das Messias Geheimnis, which means the Messianic Secret. And he pointed out, not only does nobody get it, but Jesus tries to keep it a secret. <laughs> when, when he casts out the demons, they cry out, you know, you are the Holy One of God. And he orders them, be quiet. <laughs> he heals somebody and he says, don't tell anyone. And he shows to, transfigured before the disciple, three disciples. And he says, don't let anyone know about this. And so the whole thing is like him keeping it secret. And so scholar since Vreda, people wonder, well, who, you know, why is it? Vreda's idea was an interesting one. I'm not sure everybody buys it. In fact, I know when everybody doesn't buy it anymore. But Vreda's idea was that the the Mark's Christian church, the church he was in, the Christian community he was in, uh, absolutely knew that Jesus was the Messiah, in their opinion. They, they, they confessed him as the Messiah. But they also knew that nobody was saying that during his lifetime. <laughs> and they're asking themselves, why wasn't anybody saying that? And uh, and Mark's answers, Mark, Mark writes a narrative to explain it. The reason nobody was saying it is because Jesus was keeping it a secret. <laughs> and so that's why nobody knew about it. And so it, it provides kind of a histor historical explanation. Ex uh, explanation. Uh, and so, yeah. And so it's not, as you were pointing out, it's not, none of, none of the named crit none of the named figures and none of the uh, major figures in the whole thing get it. They're, they're two anonymous people, unnamed people who actually get it at the end of the gospel, but they're the only ones. Interesting. Thank you. Um, 
I had a question now. It's just flown right out of my brain. Then let me tell you about these two who know about it. Yeah, Uh, please do. That would be wonderful. (laughs) So the the really, the the one that's a question mark is before uh, Jesus is betrayed, he's, you know, like the last day or so, um, there's this woman who comes up and anoints him with oil and the disciples get all ticked off because she's wasted all this expensive perfume. And Jesus says, leave her alone because she's she's anointed my body for burial. Uh, And that's, Okay, so it sounds like she kind of knows what's happening and what's got to happen to him. But the real clincher comes at the end when he gets crucified. At the, nobody, everybody's abandoned him and rejected him and denied him, betrayed him. And it's like, a, but he dies and uh, the centurion sees how he dies. The centurion who just crucified him. And he says, truly, this man was the son of God. And so finally, somebody recognizes that Jesus is the son of God who has to die. He's the Messiah who has to suffer. And it's the it's this anonymous pagan who's seen it. The disciples don't get it. <laughs> and so it's, again, it's another one of these things that's kind of subtly put into Mark that you don't realize, oh my God, this is the guy who gets it. <laughs> the one and only in the entire the gospel. Only. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about Mark's inclusion in the canon of the New Testament. Mm. Was there ever any debate over whether or not it should be present or was it just always kind of assumed that this is a very important book and it, and it should be yeah. brought into the, the Gospels? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question because Mark is the least uh, read and the least quoted Gospel in the ancient world. Um, Christians weren't as nearly as fond of it as they were of Matthew or or John. Uh, those are our two most popular Gospels. and Luke was popular too, Ma- Mark not so much. And it was because people thought um, that it was an abridgment of uh, Matthew. Uh, this is what St. Augustine thought, is that Matthew wrote his gospel and Mark wrote more kind of a nuts and bolts version of it, uh, which is completely wrong. It actually worked the other way around, that Mark was first. But also, M- Mark is anything but a nuts and bolts version. It's a very sophisticated uh, sophisticated book. And so th- it's a natural question. Well, you know, it did have trouble getting in. And it turns out that the answer is probably no. Um, as soon as people start talking about um, which gospels belong, by the end, it's the end of the second century or so. So the, the you got a bunch of gospels floating around at the end of the second century, and around in the one eighties or so, finally people start saying, "Look, there are four of them that are authoritative, and it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John." And so Mark was always uh, included, and I think it's because it was recognized as uh, being a uh, completely acceptable portrayal of Jesus, a very fine portrayal of Jesus, and it was thought to have been written by um, the companion of Peter, Mark. Uh, it doesn't claim to be written by that person. It almost certainly wasn't written by that person. But that's that's why um, people said um, that probably that you know. Well, okay, so it's Peter's version, just like Luke was a companion of Paul. So that's Paul's version, <laughs> and so you got Peter and Paul's versions, and then you got Matthew, a disciple, and John, a disciple. And so those are, those will be our four. I see. So, uh, King, off of that, what are some common misconceptions about the Book of Mark that you come across when you're talking to non-specialists about it? Um, it kind of depends which non-specialist I'm talking to. If I'm talking to a, um, a very conservative Bible reading Christian, the main conception is that Mark is basically doing the same thing as Matthew, Luke, and John, which is not. Um, if, I'm, if I'm talking to somebody who's more kind of skeptical about things and uh, has kind of a critical view of things, I always hear that Mark doesn't have a resurrection narrative. Uh, there's no resurrection in Mark. That's completely wrong. <laughs> there, is, there is a resurrection narrative in, in in Mark. The women go to the tomb after he's dead and buried, and they they find the tomb empty. But there's a a man there who tells them that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and they're supposed to go tell the disciples that he'll meet them in Galilee. <laughs> but then it ends with them with uh, with uh, the author telling us they fled from the tomb and they didn't say anything to anyone because <laughs> they were afraid. Boom. And, <laughs> and, so, and Christianity <laughs> never happened. Yeah, well, that's the thing. So Jesus, Jesus is raised, uh, but they didn't hear about it. And so, of course, historically, that doesn't work, right? Because I mean, <laughs> if, if they didn't tell anybody, how's Mark writing his gospel? <laughs> Mark heard about it. So it doesn't work historically, but it works as a story. It's part of the story. It's part of the idea that nobody could figure it out. Even at the end, the disciples never figure it out. Well, thank you, Bart, again, for joining me and for telling us uh, a bit about Mark. It sounds like an absolutely fascinating course. And if people are interested, there is an affiliate link running across the bottom of the screen. So you can go, you can sign up, um, even if you're watching 
six months after the airing of this video, it is still there. You can still go and learn interesting things about the Gospel of Mark. So, Bart, again, thank you so much. You're welcome.